Good evening, and you're very welcome to episode four of season four here on the League of Ireland Women's Podcast on FinalWhistle.ie. I'm Brefney Early, and I'm joined, as always, by Aaron Clark to go through all the events of the Irish women's calendar of the last week or so. Aaron, very welcome back to another week. Good to be back. Um, enjoyed the weekend's action of, of what I did see of it. Um, always great to get out and watch some live football and you know, it's 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 the fire is stoking well and truly with especially considering the results we've had this weekend already. Big big talks about around the likes of Shamrock Rovers, good win for Shells, Galway look impressive. There's a lot of lot of lot of key talking points tonight that looking forward to getting stuck into. I can't I don't think we can mention those teams without mentioning Treaty's win as well at the weekend. But we're gonna get into all of that over the next hour or so. We're gonna be joined in a couple of moments by Owen Weirin, uh, new manager of Shelburne. I say new manager, he's two games in, but it feels like he's been here six months given that he was appointed at the tail end of last season. So uh, we're going to be chatting to him about his time in the, the club and in the league so far, what his thoughts are, and I suppose getting his viewpoint on that big win for his side in PRL Park at the weekend. Um, Aaron, we, we also, there's a bit of silverware for Irish players. Uh, we had uh, the first win of the season, the Challenge Cup in the NWSL goes to uh, San Diego Waves. And, of course, Kira Cruz, the uh, Irish international, started that game. Uh, she was replaced by uh, Alex Morgan. Uh, you may have heard of her, Aaron. She's She's been around a little while. Uh, she did score the winner. But a great win for an Irish player. Denise O'Sullivan, of course, won that competition last year. So nice to see a bit of Irish uh, con- continuity through that particular competition. But uh, let's start maybe. We're going to be speaking to Owen in a few moments. But maybe let's start with your thoughts on... Uh, the league over the weekend. I know the, the Galway game was moved last minute. Uh, there was question marks over a couple of other fixtures as well in terms of late uh, pitch inspections. Your thoughts on on that and I suppose the Peas Shells game as well as probably the biggest game of the weekend? When I when I arrived at the, the PRL Park on Saturday, I was actually amazed there was a pitch inspection. And I walked on the pitch after the game doing the post-game stuff. Couldn't The pitch wasn't even soft. Um, I was very surprised the only thing is, conspiracy theorists will say the P men want the game off because obviously Saifdal named on the bench wasn't wasn't talked out. Chloe Maloney named on the bench wasn't talked out. Albert Burley named on the bench wasn't talked out. Becky Watkins on the bench not talked out. Very light in players. That's the conspiracy side of things. But I think from a Shelburne viewpoint, they done the job the way they had to do it. Probably let P men back into the game when they're one nil up and in control. But I think a lot of that's probably to do with the breeze that was blowing towards. The far end away from the, the 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 shop and you could see in the second half amanda mcquillan had to deal with some some difficult crosses but nice for nice finish from kiva keen at the start kerry letman will say she meant it not sure if she not sure if she did listen it was a, it was a, it was an important win for shells i sort of said last week it was one of them games it's a must not lose big big win for them you know a little bit of concerns over p mounts just in terms of injuries and stuff like that at the minute can't imagine James will use the all use the all club to play as as, as starting players, some fringe players. But the, for me, that was a, it was a really good win for P Mount. Um, in terms of the weekend, I think I think probably the most impressive result of the weekend is probably going to be Galway. We'll touch into that a little bit more later. Still, I'm going to say this now, and Treaty fans, don't shoot me. I'm not buying a lot into that treat result for the simple fact is it's one game. Maybe after the Shamrock Rovers game in the in the in the All Ireland Cup and in the league, we might know a little bit more. But it's still early days, but it's it's positive. And I think Wexford and Wexford and Shamrock Rovers, a draw probably suited nobody. It was around that weekend, so it was it was an interesting weekend. I I for one I'm not going to alienate half Limerick, but I think uh, I'm quite happy with Treaty. I think their performance was excellent. I watched most of the game and uh, most of the second half on Saturday on um, LYTV, and I was impressed. Uh, by some of their, their players, really, really impressive in my opinion. They never looked like they were li- likely to lose that game, and and I thought they did really, really well, particularly in the second no, half. I agree with that. It's just more I'd be intrigued to see because we probably we probably said last week they should get get a result against DLR, but it's more to see where they are. We don't really know where they are off the back of that performance, more of an of an in- inkling. So I think the next couple of weeks will tell us a bit more about where they actually are. Absolutely. Well, listen, let's take a, a little step backwards towards that uh, Peas Shells game. Of course, 2 0 the final score. You mentioned the two goal scorers, Kiva Keenan and also um, Kerry Lettner. Yeah. Scored a, a cross come shot, maybe we'll call it. Caught an Eve Rebrick out the near po- post uh, uh, late on in the game just to wrap it all up. Let's chat to their manager, a uh, new boy to the league, Owen Weir. And Owen, you're very, very welcome to the show. Welcome to the league. Yeah, thanks very much for having me, lads. 
how has the last, I suppose, maybe four or five months since you, you took on the, the position at the end of last year, um, how has your impression of the league been formed over the last five months? Yeah, look, the off-season was busy. Um, happy to see the back of it, to be honest, which I've said. I'm sure every manager in the league will say the same. And, you know, since we've been back in for pre-season, and in particular the last three or four weeks as we've got closer to the start of the season, the job's definitely got more enjoyable. In, in that sense, though, Owen, it was a difficult enough pre-season for you for the fact of not a lot of games being played. How do you sort of, as a, as a new manager to the league, how do you get that fine balance between whether you play a boys team, play another League of Ireland team, or you play a team from, from up north? Yeah, look, there was probably more challenges than I expected in terms of the, the pre-season schedule. And, you know, the weather didn't help. Um, you know, we tried to play three out of our four games on grass, um, you know, just to prepare us for the season. And we only ended up, actually, four out of four were on uh, were on the Astro. And we had one in-house game, which we had on grass as well. So, look, it wasn't ideal preparations at times. But, you know, I'm very fortunate with the people at the club and the staff that we have that, we all ensured that we got the games and, and every player got the sufficient amount of minutes and were prepared for the season. We haven't had really a, a title challenge in the last decade or so that hasn't included the, the name Shelburne in, in that. Uh, you, you come into the job, I suppose, with a bit of pressure on you as well to maybe bring it back to that league title winning uh, form of, of two and three years ago. Uh, is that sitting on your shoulders okay? Or are you comfortable in that position? Yeah, look, it's something that I think you have to enjoy and you have to embrace it. Um you know, I said it to the players at the start of the season that we expect to compete on all fronts this year and there's always going to be pressure with that. And I think, you know, with the players that we have already in the dressing room, you know, there's there's serial winners there and you have to remember a lot of the young players have, have tasted success over the last few years at underage level. So, you know, I think between the staff and the players there's enough experience in the dressing room that hopefully we can kick on and compete on all fronts. When that job comes available on... What's your, what's your initial reaction when that job comes available? Do you initially turn and say, I'd love that job? Or, you know, I'm only in the door after joining the club during the summer for the under-17s. What was your initial reaction when it sort of opened up? Look, I probably had, you know, had a feeling coming in to the job that um, the opportunity may not be far away. Um, you know, I probably wasn't thinking it would be as quick as it was. Um, you know, but I felt it was the right opportunity at the right time for me and uh, you know, give, having that few months within the academy and being able to see things, you know, with my own eyes in house, it, it allowed me to prepare and, and hopefully be the best person for the job. And hopefully, I can prove that. Coming from the academy background, does it make it easier for you to kind of know those young players coming through, both in the 17s and 19s? And kind of is your plan to kind of just keep that conveyor belt that's been so productive for Shells in recent years, just keep that flowing into the first team? Or are you looking at other? forms of recruitment as the kind of season progresses? Look, I think it's always going to be a little bit of balance. Um, and you can see that with the makeup of the squad, that there's going to be a huge emphasis still on bringing through young players. And, and look, there's been three or four. Everybody knows about Rebecca and Hannah last year, but there was three or four others that we've promoted into the first team squad this year that, that fully deserve that opportunity. And, you know, we think that they're ready. Um, you know, I know that they think they're ready and they back themselves and, and they already have the respect of the senior players and have, you know, have shown in the last couple of months that, you know, they deserve to be there. So I think with myself and, and you know, Rory coming in with me, um, you know, our knowledge and experience of the underage age groups, you know, throughout the country, not just within our own club. But, um, and look, I think it's great for the league. I think the, the more bright young talents that come through, it's only going to benefit the league and, and hopefully the international team over the coming years. I love how he says that one. Well, I love how he says that. Yeah, young Lucio Rourke makes her first start against PMO. It's just like it's it's as, it's as if it's just like one comes in, one comes out. How is it, as you as a manager? How do you you know? How do you instill that confidence in the player to say you such a young player like that to make the step up and say, you know, I trust you to go and play in this big game because we've seen in previous years where maybe some young players have been thrown in at a young age and hasn't always worked out. Yeah. I think you have to trust your own players. Um, you have to go with your good instinct. And I think, you know, when we're talking about Lucy, we're talking about, you know, an exceptionally talented player, but but also very calm and composed. And, you know, she fully backs her ability. And when she plays with that confidence, I think, you know, she gives the that confidence to her teammates and also the staff. And, you know, I thought she was outstanding. 
um, you know, on on the weekend for for you have to remember coming into your first senior game at, at that age. But you know, the last thing I said to her going out onto the pitch is I said, You've got you've got Pearl on your right, you've got Maggie in front of you and you've got Leah Doyle on your left, you'll be okay. So, um, you know, and that was the case. It's funny because she was on my notes to bring up as well. I was very impressed with her performance. Uh, definitely belied her years. In terms of that conveyor belt, can we see more players? Is there anyone you're prepared to name in terms of being in your plans for this season? Yeah, look, I, I think we've got, you know, a highly talented on the 19th side. And not only that, but there was probably three or four players that, that left their on the 19th and set up to go and play regular senior football elsewhere. And, you know, that that's a credit to the, the club and the academy as well. It's not just about us. Not everybody can play first time football at Shelbourne. But if we can, you know, do our best to prepare players to go on and have a long, successful career, then, you know, that's that, that's important to us as well. And, um you know, me and Rory overseeing that, you know, it's the 17s, 19s and 1st team we're, we're working really closely together and um, hopefully it's going to benefit Irish football as a whole and not just Shells over the next years. Take me back to pre-season, you're having them conversations with these younger players and, you know, there's a couple of, there's a couple in particular who, who, who were, were touted by a lot of clubs and a lot of clubs are trying to get their hands up. What's the conversation like when you're when you're sort of having that conversation with a young player? Because I know a lot of them will be looking for what can you give me? Can you give me first team game to what is that conversation like to try and get them younger players to stay with you? Yeah, look, I think all you have to do is speak to the senior players and, and speak with their experiences. When they were 16, 17, they were kind of just happy to be there. Um the new generation aren't like that. They're they're ambitious, they they want it now. Um, you know, and there's challenges that come with that. But I think, you know, for myself, oh, I pride myself on honesty and having the honest conversation with these players and ensure them that, you know, if they if they train well, you know, they'll get the opportunity. And I think, you know, what better senior players to learn from. I think that was a huge selling point for us as well, is you know, they'd they'd be playing under two two managers that um, you know, that that really trust them, that that want to play them, but they have to go out and earn that spot. And I think, you know, you're seeing over the last couple of games, you know, we are willing to give those young players a chance and it's up to them to take the opportunity when they get it. I suppose bringing that forward six or 12 months, we've seen the likes of uh, Jesse Stapleton, Chloe Mustaki, Emily Whelan, and, and many, many more in the last few seasons move on from Talker Park. Yeah. Uh, what are the club, are, how are the club addressing that going forward in terms of, you don't want to stop, stop these girls' progression or development, but at the same time, uh, you got to kind of look after the club and make sure that these players are, are incentivized to stay in yeah. terms of the programme and, and what's around them. So what's what's happening in that sense? I think trying to make it as professional as possible. Um, you know, and I think you can see with the with the managers around the, the, the country now at all clubs, you know, the players are going to develop here. And um, I think the standard of the game, the brand of the league is, is only going up. And I think that will hopefully, you know, attract players to stay in the level of coach and they, they'll feel... Um, that they don't have to go away as quickly as maybe they, they have done previously and they can reach a lot of their ambitions here. But I think it's it's not so much a one-club thing. I think it's throughout the league. What can we do um, as a league and, and the clubs together to make sure that you know we have something special here that players want to stay and play? You talked a bit about you know your underage, knowledge of the underage player, players and stuff like that. What's what's it been like for you, sort of making that transition to senior football? What's been the biggest eye opener, or the biggest difference that maybe you you wouldn't have expected since making that transition? I think I think with us, it, it's the case that you're dealing with 23, 24 players that want to play every week. Um, you know, with young players, it's a it's a little bit different, and you know, you you give everybody you know good minutes every week, and you can you can bring everybody on and. More or less, and I think with with senior players, it's a case. I know from for myself, I can't speak for anybody else, but you know we have twenty three, twenty four players in the squad that are that are chomping at the bit, and it's not just competition to be in the starting eleven. It's competition to be in the match day squad, and I think just making sure that you know having those honest conversations with players and making sure that there's good communication is a huge part of the job. Let's chat about the game at the, at the weekend and maybe even go back to the first week round of the game is because home to Sligo Rovers in previous seasons might have been seen as kind of a, a little bit of a, a step into the league given where they've finished up. But they really put it up to you. The goalkeeper in particular, Amber Hardy, had a 
woman of the game performance. But uh, your thoughts going into that game, and I suppose your thoughts more importantly after that game coming into the Peas game. Yeah, look, we knew it was going to be a tough game, and you know, not even myself, but the players have, have you know, discussed the fact that over the last two or three years, Sligo have t- taken points off them, and um, you know, so nobody went into the game under any illusions that was going to be the difficult game, which it turned out to be. Um, look, we knew what they would come to do, and um, they'd come to frustrate us. Uh, they'd sit in and try and catch us on the counter attack, and. Look, it's it's up to us to break teams down like that. That's that's what we're going to face, and, and we need to find solutions to those problems. And look, I, I was really happy with the performance overall. And and, and sometimes in the moment on the day, um, you know, frustration can be the overriding emotion. Um, but from watching the game back a couple of times and going through the analysis with the players on Monday evening, you know, we we were able to highlight a lot of positives that came from the game that I think are great building blocks for us going forward. You sort of change between the two games. You change system as well between Shelburne and uh, between Sligo and Piemont. Is that just showing a bit of the adaptability? Because seeing Maggie Pierce maybe going into 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 the holding midfield, then Leah Doyle slightly further forward. Is that just gonna? Is that something that you you identified from that Sligo game, or was that just uh, Piemont specific? Yeah, it was more Piemont specific. Um, I, I think with the squad that we have, you know, we we watch the game back from ourselves, you know, a couple of days after, and then all the focus was on P-Mount then. And again, we did a little bit of analysis on P-Mount on Wednesday evening, uh, on myself and Rory and the rest of the staff, we sat down and we identified areas where we think, you know, they'll be strong, um, but also areas where we can we can hurt them and cause them problems. And the team selection was purely based on that. And that, that's what it will be on a weekly basis. And the players know that, you know, we, we will go into games with a game plan and, certain attributes will be needed to execute that game plan and um you know i think it, it came to it, it panned out how we wanted this saturday but as i said there's going to be weeks where it may not be that same way and you know it's going to be a learning curve for all of us through last year we saw the introduction of the all Ireland cup and it start kicks off again this year a bit earlier and uh, next weekend you've got a trip to cliftonville i know you've had experience of playing in the the men's league up north uh, yeah. does that experience have played in different countries and particularly in the north give you any insight or is it really just a case of another game look it's a case of another game um we played crusaders in pre-season and the crusaders manager um, was actually a teammate of mine at glenavon johnny tough he was a he was a goalkeeper and a teammate there for a year so you know i've been i've been in his ear over the last few days and trying to get as much information as i can out of cliftonville and he's been trying to do the same with me out of, out of teams down here that are in their group so um Look, I think that's that helps. Those connections do help, but at the end of the day, like what I feel like with us is we just need to focus on us and, um, you know, whatever group of players we select on Sunday, we we believe that it'll be good enough to get the job done. Saturday versus Sunday game. How does that differ your your week? Because obviously you talked a little bit earlier about trying to make things as professional as possible. Yes. How does that differ the, the the fact that the game being on different days? Yeah, look, it, the only thing that will probably slightly change is is what we do on training on Friday. You know, we can we can probably do a little bit more with the players than we'd usually do on a Friday evening, just with the extra twenty four hours. So it won't change too much in terms of the preparation for us. And um, you know, that's something that that players have to deal with all the time. And you know, the, the, the teams out there and leagues out there where players are playing, you know, three four games a week sometimes throughout the year. So. Um, you know that that twenty four hour difference won't won't make any difference to us. You, obviously, you're you're well travelled, but you've been around the league as well. What's it like being back here after stints in the north and America and the UK to be back kind of playing or to be back involved in the in the game here in in Ireland? Yeah, look, I I, I love the League of Ireland, and um, you know, I'd be I'd be lying if I said I, I grew up as a as a young kid and was was in Daily Mount or Tog every week. I I wasn't. Um, I was probably had a handful of games growing up, but. From the moment I came back to the league, you know, it's infectious, it draws you in. And, and even the years that I'm away, you know, I had an LOI TV pass and would try and watch as many games as I could. And, you know, that's that's the case of an interest in Irish football as a whole. And I think sometimes when you're away from it, it can actually, your bond can become even closer. And I, I think people that have, have been in my position will, will, will testify to that. And, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic league that we have and there's amazing people involved in it. And, no, it's just the case of now trying to promote it as much as possible. But you know, I, I fully enjoy being back in it and back in the mix. So, 
what's it like when you hear them Shelburne fans in Talca Park, um, especially on the on the Saturday yeah, behind the goal, they can be quite rock, rock just at times and they give they really try and pull your team along. Even you could even hear them shouting along for, for the game in Piemont, even though there wasn't such a, a large crowd. Does how much does that sort of keep you going, especially when you look at Saturday when you have to defend quite a bit at times? Look, it's huge for the players. Um, I think the players will, will tell you, especially the ones that have been there, you know, for a few years now, that it, it it's hugely important to them and it means a lot to them. And, you know, there is times, like you said, on Saturday where there's periods of the game you're not going to go away to other title contenders and get it all your own way for 90 minutes. And I think P-Mount started, you know, again, watching the game back, I think they started the first 10 minutes of either half. They, they put us under pressure which you know look we, we did well we, we we withstood the pressure and you know when the game was able to settle down we showed our quality but in those difficult moments that's when you know the fans can be a big help and, and their support means a lot to the players to get them through the difficult times i know it's very early days in the season here Owen, but are you surprised by any of the team's performances so far we see treaty in third place galway top of the table i know it's very early it's only two rounds into the yeah. competition but has that surprised you a little bit Look, I, I think it's going to be a really competitive league, um, you know, and that's not just the opinion of mine. But I think you speak to anybody who's throughout the league now. I think you know, you guys mentioned that you know, there's probably been a couple of results in in both weekends so far that have maybe raised eyebrows with a few people. And just like the men's league, I think that that's going to be a case on a weekly basis. I don't think any any team's going to go on and win every game this year. Um, you know, we can we can just take it one game at a time, but usually what happens is, you know, seven, eight games into the season it will start the table start to take a little bit more shape then. But you know, people are still, you know, probably finding out maybe their best elevens, um, certain players trying to get back up to a hundred percent speed and uh, and and that top fitness. So I think once you get into seven, eight games into the season, um, you get a good indication of kind of where teams will will fit potentially by the end of the year. One thing that's probably been labelled at Shelburne over the last couple of years is that, no, especially when the Noel King, he had his 11 and maybe one or two others. Yeah. You've been able to bring on quite a lot of subs, plus you've still got Nadine Clare, Megan Smith-Lynch and Avo Manny to still arrive. How is that sort of competition level within the squad? Because you've seen even from the first game to the second game, you met, you said it was, a, it was opposition specific, but you made changes you use your bench how is that when you're you know when you're into these sort of tight games that you're able when you're able to pull four or five subs off at different periods yeah look it's, it's going to be a big part of of who we're going to be this year and making sure that every player in the squad you know feels a part of it um i'd be the type of person that i'd watch a lot of sports and other sports and learn from it and you know, I think you look at the Dublin GAA team over the, the successful period, you look at the Irish rugby team as well and how much the bench can impact and sometimes you want to finish games nearly stronger than what you started. So, as I said, it's just about explaining that to the players and making sure that they know, you know, now in the modern game, it, it's not a case of 90 minutes, it's potentially games could go to 100 minutes plus and you just need everybody to have that buy-in and realise it's it's a long season, there's three competitions and, and everybody's going to play a part this year. You mentioned the GA there. I know you've a bit of a background underage, and yeah. you mentioned in some places on, online about opportunities to play with Dublin. I'm not sure if yeah. that was underage or senior, but you made the choice to play soccer. How tough was that decision back in the day? Like, was Gaelic a real option for you? Um, look, it was my dad's sport, so that was probably something that you know kept me in it for for a long time. And fortunately, at a club and school level, they were able to except that the football was my my preference and i could play and train when i could but it was something i balanced you know all the way up to when i went away to west ham at 15 and um you know it was at that stage it was either take the contract in england or join the dublin miners and um you know look there, there was never a decision to be made for me but i'm still a huge fan and, and there has been times i've been in crow park over the last few years and um you know you wonder if not that you wonder if you made the right decision but when you're Sitting there watching people that you know playing in front of eighty two thousand people and winning all Ireland, you know, it's it, it's special to be in those moments and to be an elite lead athlete, it's it's an amazing thing. So but at that stage, um, you know, it was a no brainer for me and from a young age, you know, I always planned on, on getting to England and I was fully focused on that. I have to ask because you you've just said there about being an elite athlete, turning into an elite coach in an elite league. 
was coaching always done on the on the radar when you finished playing or what was the decision to go down the coaching pathway yeah look i i um i tore my first acl uh, 20 21 in my last year of my contract at west ham and that was a real eye opener for me um you know in terms of someone who had never had a serious injury before that and it just made you aware that you know your career short and it could end at any moment so I came back to the League of Ireland shortly after that. I think it was six or seven months later. And it was very much so when I came back to Ireland. It was a case of, okay, I went back into education, got a degree, a business degree, um, which I did through the, the Open University. So it was a case of from my early 20s, I was going back into education and then started on my coaching badges. And, you know, I think I had another ACL in 2017. I had a meniscus surgery in 2018. And, you know, that was kind of the... At the end of 2019, I had an A license under my belt. You know, I was finishing off my degree then, and I just felt it was the right time to step away and and, and look at something more long term. And um, you know, I think look at the position I'm in now. In the last four years, it's it's been a journey. I went to the states for three years, and you know, had you know fantastic coaching opportunities over there. And I think you know having that experience and and the different learnings has has helped me become a better coach and a manager. I think uh, America's losses uh, certainly shells and the League of Ireland women's gain. Uh, Owen, I have to ask you before you leave, the goal at the uh, end of the game of the night, did Kerry mean it or was it a cross? Look, I asked Nadine Clare. She said the two of them are inseparable and Nadine was the first place when everybody was questioning it on the bench. Nadine was, was backing her mate. So, um, look, as, as far as I'm concerned, I've watched it back a few times and um, look, one thing we've been asking Kerry to do from that area is is drill the ball in low and hard. So um, I'm hoping it was a shot. <laughs> it was probably the opposite of the delivery that we've been looking for. But look, we'll take it. And um, again, it, look, just going back to that goal, you know, Jamie Quinn wins a 50-50 on the halfway line and puts Kerry in for a great pass. So that's, that's two subs that have come on and, and made a huge impact, uh, an assist and a goal. And, um, you know, that that's the only thing I'm happy with is, the impact they made and how they contributed and whoever scores and how they score doesn't really matter to me. But, you know, for all the good football that we played and all the chances that we created, um, you know, I think there was there was a lot of chances in the game that we should, probably should have put away. There were better chances maybe than I originally even thought watching it back. So um, but they all count. And, you know, who, as I said, whoever scores them and how they scored them, it doesn't matter to me as long as it ends up in the back of the net. As a proudly, asked, as a proudly I asked question, defend, uh, I better defend Derville Laverne. I question your maths 50 50. <laughs> I question that one on the challenge, but <laughs> in the build up, yeah, uh, competitive nature to that challenge. But listen, Owen, uh, Aaron, you want to say something before we let Aaron I ask? Go? I actually asked Kerry after the game, and Kerry with a straight face is like, No, I meant, I meant, I meant, and I was like, Ah, you didn't. But it's one of this, and it's one Her, of them. Kerry wouldn't lie. <laughs> it goes in. It doesn't matter how it goes in from a from a Shelburne viewpoint. It's two clean sheets and and a win against local rivals. They won't care how it goes in. Absolutely. Yeah, look, that that's the as I said, the the clean sheets are key, and that's something that we've spoken about. I think with with the players that we have in the squad, and um, you know, we'll we'll create chances and we'll take chances, and I think that was the the thing with the Sligo game. I was more shocked with, especially how. You know how many goals we scored in preseason is that we we didn't manage to score over the course of the game and then sometimes that happens in football and you have to dust yourself off and go again and you know we got the reaction that we wanted on saturday and i was really proud and unhappy with the players you you just brought something up there i want to ask you about and that's the mm -hmm. goalkeeper situation we've i suppose women's football from the outsiders gets an awful lot of stick we see yeah. this going viral of admittedly men do it too but women's footballers making mistakes in goal uh there was one recently, I think, in the African, some African game where a girl just rolled the ball out and the player came and tapped it in. And, and we see them periodically online. The fact that we've had, I think, nine clean sheets now in 10 yeah. games, is that a, a new development in the game in general, just as the quality of players rises across the board, but particularly in goals? I do think so. Um, I, I definitely see it firsthand at our club. Like, you know, we, we've got Steve Williams, who's one of the best there is out there. And was part of Stephen Kenny's Dundalk side, um, you know, and they were highly successful and, and had a great career in the game. And I, like, he works closely a couple of nights a week with our um, with our goalkeepers from Amanda all the way down to, you know, our 15, 16 year olds that are in the academy and they all train closely together. And look, I'll be honest, Amanda's been top class since, since I've come in. And I, I, I think she's 
she's looked so sharp since day one. Um, she's impressed me, you know, not just her goalkeeping, but I think her ability on the ball and anybody that was there on Saturday seeing her distribution and that's that's so key to how we play. Um, you know, look, unfortunately we lost Courtney, um, which is a which is a big loss to us because again that was another area where we had real competition in and Courtney was fantastic also um in the initial weeks of preseason. And I, I, I do believe, you know, from our side we've got two fantastic ones. We've got, you know, three or four excellent ones, a couple of underage internationals within the academy as well. And I do think the standard of goalkeeping is on the rise. And you know, fortunately for us, we have somebody like Steve and you know the the work that he does with the players is is definitely shown on the pitch. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to chat to us. Congrats yeah. on a great win at the weekend and the best luck uh, against Cliftonville at the weekend. I, I said Glen Torn, I meant Glen Avon earlier. Apologies. <laughs> uh, thanks no for joining. Problem. Yeah, thanks, lads. Appreciate thanks, it. Oh, we're in there. Um, I that interview went on way longer than I expected. It's purely because he just had. It was very interesting to see his take on uh, uh, the league that's, and where it comes from. That's the fourth time I've interviewed on now since he's taken that shells job and even even just speaking to him after doing interviews with him, you know, he's quite an infectious person in terms of how he comes across and you can you can see the way the players are starting to sort of buy in from him. But like the thing is you could have kept him there for an hour and touched into so many different parts of his story and, and, and things that he's working on. Like I think for me you can see even what he's trying to do with, with Shelburne like it's it's an interesting dynamic. You, you've got people like Kiva Keenan playing slightly higher this year. Hannah Healy, brilliant against Piedmont, wasn't great in the opening day of the season. Has faith in the likes of Hannah, and as I said, Lucia Rourke starting. I find at said that the left side of centre back didn't look out of place. And I think there's a lot of a lot of positives from Shelburne. I think the buzz around the club at the minute, what's going on with the men as well as the women, you can you can really see. There's a there's a lot more positive. Like I don't mean to don't mean to be disrespectful when I say this, but towards the end of the Noel King tenure, you could definitely see there was a there was an atmosphere change in, in terms of the way things were done, dress rooms were done. Like I, I remember speaking to Owen after the Sligo game, and he was quite positive about the performance. And as he said there, a lot of things, and he was, he was just it was the final third. And you know, I think having someone slightly younger in there as well will definitely help. And I, I don't think he'd be the, I think he'd be the sort of manager to put an arm around the one to shout players at the shoulders and especially he's been through a lot as a player himself. So I think I think himself and Rory Kirk there will work well with work well for Shelburne. I'm not gonna lie, I was very surprised to see Steve Williams staying at the club this year. I thought Steve might have moved on considering Steve's other commitments. He was in, involved with the Glens who won the All Ireland Club, club Championship for uh for the Derry Club and the, and the Gaelic football. I think he's been involved with Loud previously as well as, as as others. So like he's a man in high demand. And the fact that Shells have been able to keep him, I think that's that's impressive as well. But this I think was a really it was a really it was a good performance from Shelburne at the weekend. Probably still didn't come out of third gear though. Yeah, no, I've seen him in action with the with Loud and he stands behind the goal and he's the loudest man in the stadium. It's it's uh but he's a huge, obviously well established player with Shells himself, uh, uh back in the day and, and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Nice. Lovely man. Lovely man. Um, let's move on a little bit. Uh, we've talked about the Shells Peas game to death. I want to go and talk about, for me, one of the biggest talking points of the weekend. Rovers and Wexford took part in a game in Tala, and Wexford took the lead. Everyone seems to have given the, the goal to Kylie Murphy. I think Abby Tuttle has been done out of a, a goal here. Um, came off her head and went up off the crossbar and in, as far as I could see. But uh, your thoughts? It's close. If they had, I'll be honest with you. If they had the proper, you know, high tech cameras there, maybe it might, we might see slightly different. But it's, it's one of them because I, I seen when you did tweet at the weekend, and I was looking and I was like, that's really, really, really close. But you Listen, don't do it. Yeah, it literally goes straight up. So I can't see how Kylie's head is level or above the ball. I can't see how she gets that ball legally. Gets that ball up. So mm-hmm. that'd be total yeah. up. Come here, the, it, but it is yeah, there's something I have to talk about in this game, okay? okay. And it's not controversial or anything, don't worry. Um, Lolly Conlon made her 200 appearance with Wexford, 26. 26 years of age. We're seeing people like Kylie doing 250 recently, Noel doing, I think Noel done 200 last season. 26 years of age playing 200 League of Ireland games. 
Yeah, like, I consider really. Lolly's had some injuries as well. Like, that's astronomical. It's, but that's it's what a, we're looking. But I think that kind of experience is what the league has brought over the last decade. I think like football has been mm-hmm. around as, as we know. Uh, we're celebrating fifty years of it in the last twelve months. Um, and women's f- sport has come on so much, particularly in women's soccer, in the last um, twelve years since the league came into being. And I think it's a huge addition to the landscape here for girls um, as a genuine opportunity: a to play and enjoy the game, but b to actually make careers both here and abroad, within the game, and to really light up World Cups, European Champions Leagues, whatever, NWSLs, you know, like I watched Denise Sullivan play at the weekend as well, and like and, and that North Carolina Courage side looked very impressive too this year. So we're going to have a lot of Irish interest, both in England, in America, and further afield, uh, but I think it's huge. I think it's been, and, and someone like that could potentially hit five, even 600, like we're seeing in the men's game. Gary Rogers five something um went before he retired and he's not even the, the highest in the league. So um yeah, I think it's great though. It's phenomenal. Oh, 100 percent It's 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 brilliant. And in terms of the game, in terms of the game itself, obviously when Wex when Wex are going up, you're thinking, will they hold on? They were difficult to run the game, so they did a, a poor opening day and then pip back by Shamrock by Shamrock Rovers again. Abby as I say, Abby Toll was very good. <laughs> Jay Merrin and Gold made some very good saves. Ex Shamrock Rovers as well. The two girls probably had a bit of a point to prove going back to Tala for the first time, considering they were they were let go during the off season. It's probably not the result that either team would have wanted, considering Rovers opening day draw and Wexford having dropped the points again, having dropped points against Bowes, considering Wexford have P-Mount and Shelburne in the next two league games. It doesn't get any easier from a from a Rovers viewpoint. Colin O'Neill talked about you know. The players who were gone, he was expecting a lot of them to go. He obviously brought some Lawless back in when Amanda when Amanda was injured. I'm hearing Amanda shouldn't be too too far away. So Anna McCartney's probably going to be a good while away. But the problem with looks at Robers is, is Robers very light on the bench. A lot of young kids on the bench. Colin O'Neill's going to have to trust a lot of these young players this season. And the longer they go, where they don't pick up that first win the season, it could make it a little bit more difficult for them in terms sure. of the. Let's talk about the goals because the one we mentioned, obviously, we argue the toss about who scored it. But um, Wexford from a corner, close range, should the defenders be doing better with that? Probably. You're always going. You're always going to say yes, but it was a it was a decent delivery, so you, you know you're always going to say yes to to them sort of things. But then again, you're probably being a bit hyper hypercritical if you get a yard of space. You expect that you expect or you get a, you get a, a glimpse of a head onto something. You expect someone to sort of to find the target. Yeah, in terms of the second goal, very similar corner from in the same net from the other side. Um, not one that some of the Wexford girls were too keen to watch back, I'd imagine. No, probably not. Probably not, to be honest with you. And but the, the thing is, is that's probably for where from a Wexford viewpoint, is they've had a tendency over the last couple of years is when they could see some goals that they probably shouldn't have and that they, that they can cut out. Like you look at the same thing again in the in the P Mount Shelburne game, there was loads of opportunities where. Jess Fitzgerald was putting dirty, dirty deliveries right on top of Amanda McQuillan. And Amanda done very well. And there was one or two times where you thought, oh, there was a bit of a scramble here. But like at this level, you know, set pieces, you have to be you have to be defending your set pieces and you have to be able to get rid get, get rid of the ball. And I think from a works review point when when you can see that when you can see that goal, you're probably you're probably disappointed. But maybe it's a it's 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 a difficult one because you don't wanna you don't wanna be too critical either. Yeah, technical issues, of course, uh, seem to be the the bugbear in treaty at the weekend. There was issues in the first half. I know I turned on the stream and just couldn't watch it. To be honest, the the audio was terrible. Uh, fixed it for the second half, and that's where really all the action happened. Two goals. Katie Lawley with one. Aaron Van Doller with a second. Treaty be very happy to get their first win up and running, unbeaten, hundred percent record after the first match. I know it's very early days, but we seem to differ on uh, on how we think it's going to go for them this year. The old DLR way of social media is in full force again. Saying, I see him under tweet saying that the Treaty United fans aren't singing, aren't singing about, uh, about about league positions and stuff like that. But no, listen, I think Treaty will be decent this year, but I, I just don't know. I can't tell you exactly where they're going to be. That's the problem. I can't sort of say they're going to be a mid-team table. They're going to be top challenge and top four. I think that sort of thing is a bit, a bit early. Was it a good second half performance on Treaty? Yes. Would they have been very disappointed losing Fianna Bradley to injury early in the first half? Absolutely. It's not what you would have wanted. 
The one thing I will say, excuse me, is you've probably seen that in the first two weeks of the season. Teams losing players in the first half of games through, 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 through knocks and injuries. It's not a, it's not been a great sort of start for that sort of thing for, for teams. But second half, listen, Aaron Van Dalder's header as well. It was, it was a nice header. It was a nice header from her, from her as well. Like I said, I said in the show when we had Dominic Foley on, the likes of Kate Lawley and, and Grace McInerney were two players that I, I was keen to see a lot of this year. I think realistically, I, I don't I don't know because I don't know what Rovers are going to play this weekend, what sort of team they're going to play this weekend. But I think that the league game against against Treaty in, in, in two weeks' time, we'll sort of get a better understanding as to where Treaty actually are in terms of how they shape up. But can you can you be happy with what, what you've had in the opening day of the season with that 2 0 win against DLR Waves? Absolutely, from a Treaty viewpoint, from a Waves viewpoint. You'd be very disappointed with the fact that you get a you get a draw against Shamrock Rovers where you you can see the, a late a late penalty and you sort of don't get all three points and then to go down to to Limerick and come away with nothing. The only thing the problem is from a DLR point of view is last couple of years they've sort of lacked that consistency in in terms of results and it's probably a game that they would have been targeting. But I think from a treaty viewpoint, listen, you've got to be really happy with that start. Yeah, of course, after Shamrock Rovers' league game in two weeks' time, a bit of a gap, but then they play two games in April uh, against Sligo and Cork. So they'll be quite confident of coming out with some positivity out of those three games anyway, and they could potentially have six, nine, or maybe even ten points out of those. Um, from their point of view, I'm sure it would annoy half of Sligo and Cork and even Rovers by saying that as well. But uh, uh, it is what it is. Trade to be very happy with that run-in. It gets tougher from there. I think they visit. Piedmont or the, the host Piedmont maybe later on in, in May as well so uh, interesting times ahead for them but uh, I'm I'm excited for Treaty, I think it's a really interesting project how it works in the medium to long term remains to be seen uh, I don't think I don't think that's the plan of the medium to long term and, and from reading what Kieran McCormick is saying, yes yes, in the medium to long term do we expect to see an influx of Canadians, probably four or five a year maybe, but I, I don't think her, in an ideal world for her is to have that many in every year, and like the thing, is, the thing is, there's another, there's a couple of things that that take into account there. Like it's cost, it's it's you know you have the the accommodate them all that sort of thing, transport for them. Whereas it's a big, it's a big ask for the club, and the problem is, is and, and Dominic sort of said it to us is is that Treaty had that sort of nearly a no go zone where. Players didn't want to sign from players. Just were like, no, I've heard things. I don't want to go here. Whereas I think I think the biggest thing for them this year is, is breaking that mold. And it's not just with the women's team on the pitch. I think it's as a club. And I think, you know, you look at the buzz that's around for the men's side as well. I think as a whole, that's the most important thing. Is if they break that mold, you see my Bowles when Bowles originally came into the league. A lot of players didn't want to go to them. Yeah. They gradually started to, to, to break that down to where they're getting better and better players in. Whereas I think Treaty can do the same. But it's just gonna it's gonna take a bit of work off the field. Yeah, I think it but it's very positive steps in the initial weeks of the season from them. Uh another game we take maybe a look at the Galway United match. Great game for them. Before we get into the actual game, though, uh we obviously haven't seen this because it wasn't broadcast because of the change of venue. Um, your thoughts on the change of venue and the situation? Yeah. I was critical. I was critical when they tweeted about pitch inspection and then there was no updates coming. I thought that was extremely poor and I was like, communication is shocking here. The one thing I will say is is that the fact that they were able to change the venue on such short notice, I think a lot of people in Galway deserve credit. I think the way the communication was handled for it was probably poor. You would hope in the background they were in constant communication with Cork being like, we have this option available. If it's not available, do you want us to go ahead and do it? You would like to think they were and they were in communication with the FAI, but it's just the way it come across on socials. It didn't come across well. The fact that they did get a change, yes, they had to delay the kickoff slightly. Listen, if they had turned around and said kickoffs at half six, you wouldn't have really cared if that game's getting played. The one the one concern you'd have is, is that you call a pitch inspection, you mentioned pitch inspection at about half two, that stage, you're probably saying Cork or what? Halfway, three quarters, yeah. halfway, three quarters of the way up, up, up to up to Cork, up to Galway already. So I'm not going to turn around and bash them and say you that game wasn't streamed. That's not good enough. The fact the game was played, I'm happy the game was played. Yes, it's always disappointing when it's not streamed, but considering the circumstances, I'd much prefer that than to see Cork potentially having to come back up here on a Wednesday evening or something like that. 
Oh, I hundred percent agree. And I wasn't trying to slide off uh, Galway. For no, no. In the game, I think it. I think it, it's preferable at this end of the season to have the games played. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, we'd like to see the games, but it's not the end of the world if we don't. Um, but it is great to the game is is most important in terms of actually getting it played. But let's talk about Julianne Russell. Her brother has been, uh, who's the, obviously John Russell, manager of Sligo Rovers. He has been scoring hat trick upon hat trick upon hat trick in the Mayo Masters uh, Division Three for the whole season. Um, and she decided she wanted to show him up on a on a bigger scale. Uh, Obviously, uh, she's still playing at National League level. Uh, albeit, I th- reckon John could probably still do a job for Sligo Rovers if he was that way inclined. But three goals from her, two from Jenna Slattery, 5 0. Phil Trill is going to be delighted with that. Two clean sheets. Yeah. Two clean sheets as well. And like you, you look at the you look at the, the fact of apart from the underdogs game last year and a pre- couple of preseason games that she would have played in. Julianne Russell hadn't kicked the ball since the season previous, and you'd swear she was playing all of last year. The way she, the way she sort of started the season, and I think in, in Galway they're they're, they're going to be very careful with her this year in terms of her body and stuff like that. But listen, if you've got a player like Julianne Russell, and Julianne Russell has that hunger the way she does, can Julianne Russell score twenty goals this season, 15, 20 goals this season? If she wants to, she's shown she's definitely capable of that. From a from a, a Galway viewpoint as well, Jenna Slattery, that's her third goal of the season as well, scoring the two, having scored on the opening day of the season. Like you've got to be really, really happy with them with that with that result from a, from Phil from a Phil Trill viewpoint. From a Danny Murphy viewpoint, a lot of people talked about you know the PMO performance was a bit of a step on. It now makes me question when I look back at the PMO performance and I look back at PMO at the weekend. Was it a fact that payment maybe weren't as good or and Cork were, were better on the opening day of the season? Because I didn't see 5 0 coming in this game, and that's being honest with you, I didn't see that coming. Could, but could then you, again, could you attribute some of that to the change of venue and the change of time and kind of plan and prep and, and even just down to diet diet stuff and in terms of nutrition on the way up and all the timings would have been thrown out of kilter late on in the preparation for the game? Potentially, yeah, Potent- potentially it can. But the one thing is, I, I can't imagine Danny Murphy be making that sort of excuse. He'll just, be, you know, and that's that's the sort of thing that maybe we can. But the thing, the thing from a from a Galway viewpoint is like when they had them, when they had them, you know, when they score a couple, they then put the knife to them and they decided that they were gonna go go for blood and score on on score five. But the fact that that backs up the Galway performance against Athlone. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm gonna have to start having a look at Galway in the next couple of weeks and thinking, is my thing of saying Galway maybe a year too too early in terms of challenging for top two, top for a top two slash title, was maybe last year that big bridging gap that they that they needed and they've taken that extra massive step on. The next couple of weeks will definitely tell us an awful lot about whether Cork have made improvements or. Are, are Cork are still the same, or are Galway were just that good on the day? Yeah. Final game of this of the weekend was, of course, uh, Athlone Town's visit to Bowes. Uh, Bowes had won on the opening day. Athlone had been beaten. It was the meeting of the two former colleagues at Athlone <laughs> the previous year. Um, Ken Kernan, of course, moved to uh, Bohemians, take up the, the hot seat there. Um, I think it's a uh, master one student nil potentially in that particular encounter this year a really well worked goal Casey Howe good interchange on the left wing and a beautiful cross Chloe Singleton literally couldn't miss uh, from the position Casey Howe put her in she seems to be the the the, the missing link in that lone midfield in terms of creativity and, and giving other girls opportunities to get the ball in the back of the net Brefney I'm going to turn to this game again and I'm going to say what I said on the other on the other game earlier Players going off injured early in the game is a concern for me. Maddie Gibson this time. The one thing I will say on this game is, and I'm sure you probably have the stat to hand to answer my question straight away, is the amount of headed goals this weekend. It's probably the highest we've had in a long, long, in a long, long time. I think like, if you if you look at the but I'm thinking out in my head, yeah, the, the two in Shamrock Rovers, you could argue, were were headed goals. Um I'm trying to think now off the top of my head who's I, I don't know the Galway ones to be honest. One was a penalty, so that wouldn't count. Shells didn't have a head of goal. Um, but Chloe Singleton on, on yeah, Chloe Singleton's yeah. goal, like 
it was a lovely, it was a, it was a nice finish, but it just shows you when you have that bit of extra quality and you know what Casey held on as well to sort of to 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 try and provide her. Like I think that combination could score a half full of goals together and have a half full of goals and assists both ways this season, whether it be Casey finding the net and Chloe being the assister, or Chloe finding the net and Casey follow Casey giving the assist. I think you can definitely see. Casey's gonna add an awful lot there. I think we were having a conversation about who 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 done better out of the trade between Athlone and Sligo. Like while uh, while Sligo got two very good players, and I think Casey has the one that if Tommy could have kept one, that's the one he would have really wanted to keep. And I think she's gonna be a massive addition from a Vols viewpoint. You're, you're disappointed to lose that game, 933 in Daily Mount as well. I think there was a big crowd, and I think there was a, a 900 crowd in Shamrock Rovers as well. The weekend, two big, two big, big crowds, and like I think from the Boas viewpoints, this it's always this, it's disappointing. But I do think these two, these two sides will will be battling out in and around each other this this sort of season for in around fourth, fifth, sixth this year. I think they'll be sort of in that in that mix this year. I think. I just I'm not 100 percent convinced that just that alone have the firepower up front to to challenge for the league title this year, but good win for them. Yeah, I think we'll agree to disagree on that. I think I think both teams if they if they keep consistent um could challenge for, for top spot. Listen, spot potentially. Listen I I'll tell you the, I'll, I'll tell you this now. I think this could be the year that we probably see less than ten points potentially separating for Unless, unless somebody runs away with it, which I don't think this season could be the season we see maybe 10 points separating five or six teams. I think it's definitely going to be the lowest points per game winning season for sure. But maybe it may, it's, it's it's too early to sort of judge who's title contenders and not. And the problem is, is I say this now, I don't want to go in six on the bounce. The next time I'm an athlon person on, I'll be eating loads of humble pie and there'll be nothing new. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose from our point of view, uh, in terms of being a Westerner involved in the women's game, seeing Galway with a big win, Treaty with a big win, uh, even at Lone, uh, we've claimed them a little bit. They're kind of, kind of kind of. No, 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 no. <laughs> You're not getting at Lone. You're not getting at Lone. At Lone and Midlanders, you can have the other two. But the one thing that I will say, and I've said this to you since one of the first shows that I've been on, is that. In order for this league to flourish, we need strong always. We need strong Limericks. We need a strong Cork. So hopefully Treaty can be very good this year. Cork can pick it up. And we need strong regions to, to really help and grow and grow the league. But listen, first two weeks, God, we're the only team with a 100% record. Incorrect. Treaty United. Sorry, well. sorry, Treaty. Go with the only team with six points. The is down. I have you. No, go with United, top of the league, obviously, with six points. Still two points behind. Treaty and Bowes, Pease, Athlone uh, on three points. Shamrock Rovers with those two draws so far uh, on two points. And then Sligo, DLR and Wexford with a single point each. And Cork propping up the bottom of the table uh, yet to get a point. But uh, promising start. And I just said, Seeing those teams taking points off each other, we're seeing that more and more as we go on. Let's take a quick look at the fixtures for the week ahead. Uh, we have Bohe- uh, I'm apologizing. No, we're having it. We're having uh, this week. Avenir Sports Cup. It's not called the Avenir anymore, but I think oh. uh, all the PR seems to just be sports All Ireland Cup fixtures. So uh, we we give Avenir a bit of a. Is this, is this back to back? Is this? I think this is back to back as well. If I'm not mistaken, I think Sligo and Galway play in the league as well in the next round of league games, like Treaty and Shamrock Rovers. Uh, potentially, I don't know, but there are the fixtures for next week. DLR Waves versus Crusaders, um, Crusaders Strikers, Piermont United versus Linfield, Treaty United versus Shamrock Rovers, Cork City FC versus um, Wexford, Sligo Rovers versus Galway United, Cliftonville versus Shells, Bowes against Lisburn Ladies, and Glen Torn against Athlone Town. Just to make people aware, as you can see, where Breffney has his nearly has his mouse up on that screen there, guys. Cork City versus Wexford is in Ferry Carrick Park, not in Turner's Cross after Cork City's All Island Cup games have been moved out of home venues to swap to away games. As well as that, DRL uh, DLR waves will be in White farms ground so just to make yourself aware of those particular venue changes the times and stuff there six of the games live on loi tv all six of the uh, based in the uh, i suppose the league of ireland teams have the facilities so we won't have live action of cliftonville or of glen torn 
on LOI TV, but the other six all scheduled to be broadcast uh, from the various venues. Your thoughts on the fixtures this week, Aaron, in terms of who uh, you're looking forward to seeing Clash? Yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to DLR, uh, Clifton Bill, especially. Uh, DLR Crusaders definitely after the back of last year. The two teams were, there wasn't a lot between them last year, and I think it could be an exciting game. Um, Clifton Bill done well last year. Picked up some good results. Shells down up there on Sunday be a, be an, be an interesting enough game. I think Linfield, depending on how Piemont sort of approaches game, Piemont Piemont could be in trouble. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the game that we see we definitely see a northern a northern team win this weekend. Yeah, some uh, big games ahead for both sides of the border. If we look at the under-19 grade uh, over the weekend, some uh, decent results there. If we flip back to the results, uh, you'll see uh, Cove, DLR, sorry, Cove beaten by CK United, DLR Waves beaten by Galway United, uh, Bowles with a big win, Flagler Rovers also, Wexford, really beaten by Cork, and Dundalk with a big win over Piedmont United. Now, apologies, don't have the a result of the Shamrock Rovers at Lone Town game to hand. We see the league tables up here. Uh, Shells and Finn Harps leading Group A in Group B. Again, a game missing there between the two leaders. One of those uh, would have picked up points. I might just try and get that in the meantime. But Galway United, uh, six points uh, from Sligo and DLR on three, while Bray Wanderers are back. Definitely sorry just to stop you there. Um, at Lone Town beat Shamrock Rovers 3 now. Perfect. So at low on top of the table with nine points. And in Group C, we have Cork City and Wexford still on nine points. Unbeaten, 100% records for them. Treaty, CK United, that's Carlo, Kilkenny United, and Waterford on three points, while Cove Ramblers uh, at the foot of the table still to pick up a point. If we go quickly to the under-17 grade, again, looking at the results from over the last two days, it was strong, but uh, Draha won the loud derby, Galway United beating St. Patrick's Athletic, Bowes and Harps scored a straw, Treaty United 3-0 winners over Mayo, DLR Waves similar, uh, 3-0 victories over Sligo Rovers, uh, Cork and Wexford fell foul of the weather, while Bray had a good win in Kerry, Waterford beat CK United, and at Lone Town in a 7-goal thriller against Piedmont United, they took home the spoils. League tables look something like this. Shells, of course, only with one game played in this competition so far but Bohemians top of the table Shamrock Rovers behind on six game in hand Andrade also on six while in Group B we see Galway United Treaty Athlone top of the table with six points each four for DLR Waves and St. Patrick's Athletic and Piemont on three with Sligo Rovers and Mayo yet to pick up a point at under 17 level and in Group C we have Wexford Cork City and Waterford 100% record after two games Kerry on three points alongside Bray while Cove and CK United still to pick up points there. So uh, for me, when I look at those underage uh, results, I'm seeing teams like Waterford get picking up results, St. Patrick's Athletic picking up, picking up results, Finn Harps getting games, uh, getting wins as well at 17s and 19s. That's promising for the future of the growth of the game across the country, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, I, yeah absolutely. The one thing I will say is I'm probably a little bit surprised that Finn Harps probably haven't applied just yet to come into the senior team. I probably thought, considering they've been in the underage league, as done the all league for a couple of years, that they may have done it. I wouldn't be surprised to see if, if the likes of themselves are called for the next two. Uh, Pat's, Pat's coming in, it's, it's always good, especially considering the fact that the amount of players in, in, the, in the Dublin region that we tend to lose to other sports, having another team there available at underage is, is a good option. The one thing I will say is people just be a little bit a little bit cautious of the fact of another Dublin team coming into the into the into the into the, league, into the league at senior level. For me, we're probably three, four, or five years away from that until we maybe get a second division. Because I'd be I, I I was a little bit cautious of Rovers coming in as well because the fact of having so many Dublin teams is a bit of a concern for me, despite the population. But I just like to see some of the more region teams sort of make the the transition first before we start to see more more and more Dublin teams coming in. Yeah, we've been a big advocate here for a second division in that competition. I think it would help everybody, particularly those in the bottom three or four slots in the league year on year to get more games at a slightly lower level to get themselves more established as it goes. We've about a minute left because we want to get out of here before the arrow mark. Uh, finally, we want to chat NWSL uh, launch last week. I want to buy that Kier Cruz. I want to buy that San Diego Waves jersey. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. You can, of course, watch uh, all of the NWSL games. There's a load of Irish girls. Marissa Sheeva has made a, a move to wash from Washington to Portland. Portland. That's a big move for her. They'll compete this year as well. Um, and 
we'll see uh, Kira Caruso obviously will be at um, San Diego Waves. They've had a, a trophy win at the start of the season. Bright Sparks out of S. North Carolina Courage with Denise O'Sullivan. Very lucky maybe just to pick up a yellow for a... Uh, some sort of a, I want to say MMA move uh, at one point during the game. Uh, it's interesting. Look back at it if you can. All the games are free on the NWSL website, and uh, you can watch the whole season, which is phenomenal. And finally, Sinead Farrelly, not involved with Gotham at the weekend, but in the squad, has a contract for this year. So uh, she had a bit of a, a bit of a toy injury. Yeah, so she will feature uh, as the season progresses. But two more teams in the league this year in um, Bay FC in the San Francisco region in San Jose and Utah Royals just outside. Uh, I think it's. I'm not sure what city in Utah, but it's not Salt Lake City. It's the other one, Provo, maybe, um, in terms of, of where it's going. So no Challenge Cup, down to one Charity steel, charity Shield-type final, and there will be uh, 26 games in the regular season. So plenty of action over the next seven or eight months, maybe nine months uh, of the season to watch. But uh, do check that out as well. They're late nights, so you can watch your League of Ireland during the weekend and then throw on the NWSL for the late-night celebrations. Aaron... As ever, a pleasure to be chatting to you for the last hour or so. To Owen Weir, and particularly thank you for, to him for joining us at his shell side. Enjoyed a big win at the weekend, and they'll be looking forward to bigger and better things as the season progresses, hopefully a league title challenge from them as well. Um, your thoughts as we finish up All-Ireland all Cup start the weekend. Any outside bets? We saw Galway beat Cliftonville in the final. Right I think Galway, Galway could be a good bet again this year for, for a repeat. Does it depend which teams kind of take it on and which teams are kind of using it as games for, for their subs? For ben? Yeah, a, a bit of that. But the other side of it is, I think, for the fact of the way the competition is structured this year, I think a lot more teams may take it a little bit more serious for the fact that they've got that spaced out between games. It's not a fact that it's played over such a quick period. But I would expect to see the likes of your Galway's shells being there or thereabouts. I think... Rovers might use it for a bit of experimenting with some of the younger players. I think P-Mount will definitely use a bit of experimenting. And I think some of the other sides, like your DLRs, your Corks, could could pick up a bit of form throughout these, game, throughout these games. And I wouldn't be surprised to see Treaty go all out and see can they pick up that bit of momentum. I, I genuinely think we're going to see a team who isn't on that list you've just mentioned make it a serious target for the year to try and win a bit of silverware. And I wouldn't be surprised to see maybe... I don't know, some of those uh, sides that we don't tend to see at the top of the table kind of feature. Could we look maybe at a DLR or a Sligo making a bit of a breakthrough, even a treaty? Um, I'd love to see one of those kind of making a run for it. And obviously in the North, Derry City aren't in it this year, but um, the science with the fold. It's, it's, top, it's top two out of group this year, isn't it? I don't know. I think, it's top, I, think, I, think it's top, I think it's top two in the quarterfinal. Well, that would make a lot more sense than what happened last year. But listen, it is the week done for us. We'll be back next week with another show. Um, and uh, till then, Aaron, I suppose uh, we'll chat to you later.